Okay, here we go. Yeah. Sam and Mason, thank you so much for travelling up here to join us. Thanks for having me. Uh, I haven't read all of your book, but what I've read, what struck me is the way that it's written. The way that, as well as providing like a very descriptive commentary on the scenes and the experiences that you had, the way that you used the music that you listened to as well. Um, yeah, it was. It, it, it's great, and I can't wait to finish it, to be honest. There was, there was a very straightforward reason for that, and... Um, for, for people that the book deals with, it's a life story. It's my life story. And, yeah. and every time I say that, I feel quite grandiose, like who cares? But but it, it is what it is. And, and some remarkable things happen and some really sad stuff happens and some funny stuff happens. And and I'm a recovering addict and, and, and it deals with a lot of that. And the question most people ask me was like, how did you remember any of that stuff. Yeah. It's kind of like you started using drugs in 1985 and you didn't stop till 2006. Mm. And the way I remembered it was via music, by just thinking what what song, what band was I for? So, you know, as a 12-year-old, as I went to see The Jam. Mm. Changed my life forever. And when I started thinking about The Jam, I was like, oh, yeah, so I'd have been wearing a Lonsdale when they were cool right? <laughs> in the 80s because Paul Weller wore one you know, and he had his hair cut a certain way and and that's how I'd sort of pieced the, my life back together really once I cleaned up and had a few years clean it was like okay so if I remember the, the music everything sort of seemed to come from music and football really that's that you know, that's how that's why I did it and and some people who have been observant and read the book realise that every chapter is a title of a song mm. yes yeah, <laughs> yeah. So did you did you use any sort of writing as part of your recovery process, or was this something that happened a long time after? Because the book came out in like, the book 2012, out, 2013. Yeah, it came out, so it's, it's six years old. Um, and what had actually happened was, so just sort of the backstory to people who don't know, it, it essentially is it's chronic heroin addiction mm. and homelessness and getting arrested a lot and and da 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 um, and all through those periods where things had got bad to the point that I was just walking around with a bag and trying to find a hostel to stay in or whatever, I kept a diary. Not every day, but you know, most of it, when I read read it years later, was it's quite hard reading because it's quite, I think self piteous would be generous of me. It's, it's dark and it, a lot of it, I don't want to live and what's you know and and lots of regret and remorse and how did this happen and. And then occasionally, they'd, probably after I'd had a hit, they'd be, well, I'm going to sort this out tomorrow. <laughs> it's always tomorrow. You know, once you've scored and used as an addict, everything's back on again, you know, yeah. until the next day when it's not. Anyway, I, I, I'd somehow managed to keep some of these diaries and I'd been in a lot of detox facilities. Um, one particular one I ended up in eight or nine times and they had a computer in there and, and one day, one of the staff was like, oh, show me how to save something onto a floppy disk. <laughs> 1994, five, whatever. And he said, so if you type your diary up, you're in here for three weeks, got nothing else to do. Why don't you start typing some of this up? So I was kind of one finger like that. <laughs> and then I saved it onto a floppy, a Windows 95 disk. Okay. And then there was other detoxes and other and I kind of managed to save this disc which became a CD ROM which became a USB thing over the years yeah um and then when when I got the offer to to write a book it was all saved it, it was and and I'd written other stuff and um so the the, the bones of it was there it, it was then became a, a, a an exercise in sort of joining the dots a little bit and um and that that's how it sort of started had you had you told like the, those nearest and dearest and people around your family and that your story in that much detail, or would it have been a lot of it news to them? Because there, I mean, there's one thing that book it's so excruciatingly honest, isn't it? There's no nothing left unsaid, or maybe there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't um, feel like there is. I was mindful when I wrote it that that I have a daughter. Sure enough, she's and, six, and seven. She, well, now she's eleven, right? But at the time, she was six or seven, and and so that that was always, you know, okay. So one day, she's probably going to read this. Yeah. And as much as I'd like to think my parenting skills have 
or is helping to create a really open-minded young woman. Yeah. There's some stuff that I just thought, do I need to put that in? Mm. Is that actually going to serve the book any more than something that perhaps one day she might read, which isn't? So I guess I'm giving some in a way there. There is some stuff that I didn't want to get into because it, I, I didn't really see the point. Um, and uh, the rest of it, what I found was people sort of thought when who've written books like, you know, memoirs, and, and there's lots of them, and mine's just one of many, 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 you know. And people get, is there a catharsis in that? And, and, and I'm not sure that there was. I'd, I'd had a lot of time in residential treatment I'd, I'd had and, and we have a we still just about have an amazing NHS that had identified that one of the consequences of my drug use was that I have mental health issues of depression and, and you know you take thousands of hits of acid and, and ecstasy you're gonna there's gonna be consequences um, so I'd engaged in all that kind of stuff as well I didn't feel the need to sun, unpack this life with the expectation that at the end of it I'd be skipping off into the sunset, whistling zippity doo dah. That wasn't kind of my expectation. It just, um, it made me laugh. As bizarre as some as that might sound, I, I, I deliberately wanted to try and make other people laugh. Maybe you know, there's some really dark things, childhood sexual abuse, and no one's going to laugh at that. Mm -hmm. I hope. But some of the other stuff with the benefit of a few years down the line from when it happened, I was able to go, oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I think yeah. the, the thing that people said the most when it was published and when they read the book and subsequently was that allowed the, the dark stuff to be as dark as it was because there's some relief every now and again, you know. I wouldn't be able to read 300 pages of abject misery if someone else's misery. I just mm. it wouldn't, it just why, <clears throat> you know, why would you do that? Me and Adam have been speaking a lot about Hunter S. Thompson lately, haven't we? Yeah. It did remind me of him, actually, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's sort of gonzo journalism where at, at the... Obviously, yeah, the sexual abuse, you know, there's, that's just unequivocally not a laughing matter. But even when you talk about some really grim drug at moments when you're taking drugs, it's almost got that gonzo journalistic style where, like, there's almost like a... a not an upbeat, but there's a laughter, the absurdity of it, I suppose, that you're looking back and saying... Fuck was I doing? I think I, I, I again deliberately. I mean, there's this one I talk about when I went to Nebworth to go and see <laughs> Oasis, right? And, and you know, it was going to be the it was my birthday, it was the best day out of my life. You know, I'm on the guest list just about. I've got some stuff to take with me to fucking, you know, do, 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 and, and you know, some stuff, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I end up back in London, I've missed it you know, in some squalid, mm. you know, crack house, trying to in inject myself, with, you know, and now I look at it and I look at that person and I have a, a real sympathy for that person. Me, you know, like, that's really sad. Yeah. But I did remember, I do remember writing that passage of the book and just thinking, <laughs> kind of laughing, at, it's absurd, it's ridiculous that... My parting words, I think, on, on, on that chapter is I'm watching the news and they're doing the headlines of Oasis and I'm just like, yeah, cunt. <laughs> you know, just, it's crazy, really, mad. It's like with Pete, when we spoke to PJ, which, yeah. uh, do you, does that just feel like a different person that some of that stuff happened to? Yes and no, because, I, I mean, I, I was having this conversation with someone this afternoon up here about, my understanding of the nature of addiction or alcoholism, we'll call it what you will, and, and some people reach a point in their recovery where they consider themselves recovered. Recovered. Yeah. Like permanently so. I, I don't really know what that means to them. Yeah. You know, it, it, maybe you'd have to ask someone, you know, because I don't think that, there's ever for me and, and some people might say well you're, you're kind of limiting your you know your own sort of development here i don't know what recovered means you know to me i'm in recovery and will be and i have no problem with being yeah. in recovery um because some of the thinking that it seems to be attendant with with addiction the sort of 
self-loathing sometimes, the, the, the lack of self-esteem, the, the chronic doubt. The, I still get that. Uh, and, it, and it's a random thing. It doesn't seem to be related to anything that's happened. You know, as I said to you before we started, you know, I got married three weeks ago. Yeah. You know, I have an amazing wife. My daughter, you know, is amazing. The beds are doing all right. Whatever. <laughs> there's, loads, there's nothing bad going on. Mm. I'm really, really fortunate to have this life. And yet, a couple of days after our wedding reception, which was the last week, in fact, I woke up and I was just like, what's the point? In anything, in anything, is this really dark thing that, that now I, I'm not going to self-diagnose myself as, as you know, but that's the sort of thinking that, that I woke up with every day when yes. I was using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if there's a, a, a point of ever being fully recovered. I've had, you know, I've sat in enough self-help groups over the years. Yeah. I, I've had therapy, da -da -da -da, and, and it's still there. And, and so I sort of think to myself, you know, um, it's just another part of the journey and, and I don't know if it's ever going to go away. Do I recognise myself? Yes, I do, because essentially that was a younger version of me. But maybe if you were to ask someone who was 70, if they, if they would, what would they say to a 20-year-old yeah. version of themselves? They'd probably say, well, I'd say, well, I wouldn't waste my time. He wasn't listening, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Russell Brand says a similar thing, he, he, and he, he talks about like he, when he when he talks about addiction, he says that basically you you're pretty much in recovery forever. It, it, it doesn't feel like there's a point where you're recovered. Yeah. Um, and he he's referred to uh, heroin, for example, as like meeting up with an old ex girlfriend. He's he's referred to that previously. Um, do you know when you were writing the book, yeah. which was some years yeah. um, after? You were um, after I got clean. You, it was six clean. years after six I got years. clean. Yeah, yeah. And you're really taking yourself to those dark places. Certainly in the level yeah. of description that, yeah. that you've got into. Uh, how did that feel? Like, did you feel like was there ever a point where you're thinking I'm taking myself into some really dark places? Yeah, I don't know where this where this could go. The honest truth is no. When that did happen, was that after after the book was published, it, eighteen months or so later, we we turned the book into a play mm. like mm. a one man show so it was like a theatrical version of the book which we did at the Lantern Theatre up, up here we sold out both nights when it was on Blundell Street it's yeah. gone now and it was very much a, a kind of theatrical for want of the better word walk through of, of certain chapters of the book and there were nights when I was doing that that I you know I mean to be on stage on your own for two hours and unpack all that stuff. And mm. I, I don't wish to make myself sound like some sort of superhuman, but it's fucking difficult mm. because it that that it's not really acting, you know. It's it's just reliving things. Mm. And the the part where you know I lose my, when my father, my dad dies when I'm eleven and I get taken home and and every night I did that, I felt like that eleven year old kid. Wow. I went to that place of hysteria. It was one of the hardest things to do. But it, it, it couldn't not be in the show, it, like it couldn't not be in the book. Yeah. It's a cataclysmic loss for yeah. any child to, to, to lose a parent. And I think for a boy at 11 years old to, to lose his dad, not that there's ever a good time for that, it's kind of when you sort of really start to need your old man, if you, you know. Mm. Mm. And that's another thing that I don't think you, I, when I speak for me, will ever fully recover from, mm. if that makes any... And I don't mean to sound self-piteous or mm. like some permanently damaged basket case, but, yeah. you know, there's sometimes I'd, I kind of think, I miss my dad. Or I miss having a dad. Or what, what would my dad think? You know, and I'm a 51-year-old grown-ish up man with a child of my own uh, and I suppose that the repairing of that is in my own parenting with my daughter mm. it's crazy uh, some kind of weird warped irony as well that the guy who approached her to do the play passed away didn't he before you even yeah it, Phil Fox was a recovering addict who, who'd set up a theatre company and I was at one of their productions the other day called the Outside Edge Theatre Company because he understood that 
for a lot of people, the process of recovery involves the dropping of the sort of masks of, of the addict. Uh, you know, people that have spent a long time in institutions, done a lot of jail, have this kind of like, you know, you know, fuck him, you know what happened was, well, I sliced him up, and, and it's all nonsense, right? But it, it, it keeps you safe in jail. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's just a mask. You talk to any lads, and I know plenty of them that have done serious jail time in Walton or wherever it is, and they're in recovery, and they say, I was just as fucking scared as everyone else. Yeah. Mm. You know, I know some of the lads that were on, on the roof at Strange Ways in the riots, you know, back in the 80s. Like, hey, and some of them are in recovery now. And, and, you know, these are guys that on the surface look terrifying. Yeah. And that's a terrifying environment to be in, particularly when there's a full scale riot going on. But you talk to them now and they say, I was scared. I had to learn how to demonstrate vulnerability. And one of the things about, drug addiction or alcoholism is it throws a blanket over all that stuff mm. you know the Dutch courage that, that people talk about um, and, and, and I think particularly with opiates it just saturates all that sort of stuff so that when you if you find a way out of it you kind of have to learn how to to live from a really basic level I think you know feeling mm. vulnerability and you know to to sit in front of, you know, other people sometimes and unpack all that stuff um, is is takes guts. It you know I don't, it's not for the faint-hearted. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's you know if you really want to connect with other people, if addiction is what I believe it to be a complete disconnect, mm. then you have to reconnect. And, and you know, <clears throat> just then talking about my dad, I, I felt tearful. Mm. It's interesting that like I felt angry reading that part of the book because and you say it in the book but for me it's like how many I don't know per se if anyone's to blame other than the fact that so many warning signs about a damaged young person seem to just be completely disregarded you've lost your dad yeah. you then you lose your grandfather you, yeah, dies, so, so your, your guardian yeah. in, in lieu of that your lovely yeah. granddad all these things already happen to you and then like you get introduced to like your gateway of having this spliff and for me it was just like it just felt so, so something someone could have intervened or someone could have recognised that you were at risk of the challenges were stacked up against you weren't they at that point yes and no but but I was doing a pretty good job of of, of letting everything you know everything's alright you know that that that's inherent in in the nature of 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 addiction or in, in my addiction is this kind of I'm alright I'm okay I'm fine surface level almost like the actor yeah I'm fine I can, I've got my shit and, together and you know it was it was the mid eighties. People were, were there was other things going on in the world other than what was happening with me. You know, I I, I don't think I knew the extent of the damage. I mean, to, the, my anger was always that the perpetrator of the sexual abuse was was protected. Yeah, by the Catholic Church was farmed off to a, another parish where he was allowed where he continued to do what he did. And um, I still feel angry about that. Yeah. You know, I still feel angry about that. For my own recovery, for my own sense of being okay, mm -hmm. one of the most challenging things to do in recovery has been to find some acceptance. You know, we, we talk about why would you let someone live rent-free in your head? For the rest of your life, you know that's that's more damaging. Yeah, you know, that that's where the long term, you know. So, and I couldn't tell you how I found that resolution, but I kind of I kind of knew that that when I cleaned up this time, that I couldn't avoid it. For me, it was something that had to be dealt with. There had to be some kind of resolution, and I, I generally don't know how I got to that point, but I know that I did. Um, and and I think that's probably one of the fundamental differences in, you know, the book is there's relapse after relapse after, re you know, it's like another rehab, another... What what was different this time is, is another question that I've been asked over the years. Why in 2006, yeah. when essentially your circumstances had been more or less the same for the previous 10 years, they were fucking grim. Um, what happened in 2006? And I think in 2006, I accepted that there's the getting clean, and then there's the recovery that 
is in, inherent it needs to happen for some people I, other people I don't know but for me there was some bravery required there was some looking in the mirror there was looking for my part in stuff my response to stuff um, and I'd never really done any of that previously I just thought if I just stop everything will be alright and, and it never was yeah how do you feel about somebody's relapsed and relapsed and relapsed like you just said how do you feel about how we deal with addiction now in terms of the criminality of it as opposed to my my view is to you know treat it as an illness. Uh, yeah, well, what, what, as someone who's, who's experienced it for, for such a prolonged period and been through re rehab after rehab, how do you think we're, we're getting any better at dealing with it? No, no, we, we're clearly not, are we? You know, we, we, the, the, and I'm, 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 Billy might have talked about it or, or PJ. You know, if you look what they've done in Portugal, yeah, they, they did. What's what, it's really interesting actually. You know, that the, yeah. they had as bad a drug problem in Portugal as, as anywhere else in Europe, maybe worse. Yeah. In certain areas, the rate of, of criminality of bloodborne viruses was going through the ceiling, all to do with people caught in the criminality and the addiction. So they sort of went, hang on a minute, we've had this war on drugs for 40 years. It hasn't in any way, shape or form, you cannot show any kind of evidence that it's had any effect whatsoever, other than saying, well, we've kept a lid on it because if it, you know, that's that's really the only argument yeah. that yeah. that the anti decriminalisation lobby have. We've kept a lid on it, really. <laughs> have you? You know. So my own opinion, and I, and I use that you know yeah. carefully, is that what do we have to lose by by having a wholesale change of approach to this and, and treating it as a medical social issue because pretty much all the addicts that I've met um, in recovery who ended up in the criminal justice system say it did no good whatsoever all it did was actually give them access to more drugs different levels of crime so on and so forth yeah. and, and you know um, mix them with the wrong people well, the right people, if, if, if you're still <laughs> using <laughs> yeah. into crime, but, yeah, it, yeah. but but for the rest of us, yeah. And, and you know, and in Portugal, the, all those rates of, of re-offending, uh, uh, of, of people catching blood, have dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. And they seem to have a pragmatic, sensible approach to it. The problem is, it's not a vote winner, is it? No. You know, it's really not on a knee side. And, and right now, where everything polarized. is so polarised, yeah. right, exactly. And, and we're going to not talk about politics because it's just having fucking bored of it, right? But but you're right. Everything is so polarised now. No one is going to stick their neck out and go, right, we're going to renationalise the railways. <laughs> we're going to, oh, and we're going to make drugs legal. And of course, the problem is with certain substances, crack, for example, is how do you safely prescribe crack? Well, you can have like a shot with a revolving door that someone goes in mm. as a pipe and it comes back out and because of the nature of the crack just goes back. You know, I don't know how any the, the actual practicalities of it. Yeah. Well, one of the Scandinavian countries, it might be Finland, but I'm, I might be wrong, forgive me if I am. But one of the Scandinavian countries has something like that for heroin at least. They've where had... they, they, they will prescribe it, mm. but you've got to take it on the premises. Yeah. And then people will go there, whether it's in the morning, before work or whatever, uh, and then we'll 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 live, you know. They've had it in lives, Switzerland. They've, they've had it in, in certain in lots of European countries. They they have test um, facilities in certain parts of the UK, and they look at people and say, "Well, at the end of the day, you know, we we need to treat this person as as not well, and they're going to do this." And and the evidence suggests that people can live criminally. You know they don't, they don't have to engage in criminal behaviour anymore. They can they get people to go to work. Mm. Um, I'm not saying that's the best way for someone to live, yeah. but it might be a better way. It than, has to be better. It has to be because better. They're not they actually did it in Witness many many years ago. I wrote a long rambling journalistic blog about this years ago, a long time ago. I think it was Witness or Wigan, and, and they prescribed long term opiate users with heroin, pharmaceutical heroin. And guess what? The crime rate disappeared. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's there's no counter argument to it. It's like you know. Um, so why did why did that not get beyond the, the trial then? 
change of government. Was that just one councillor sticking his neck out, really? Pretty much, I think, origin? yeah. Yeah, and I'm willing if someone wants to correct me on that, but I'm pretty... And, and, and Switzerland was famous for it, and, you know, they have different laws in different parts of Europe where people are viewed as, as look, you know, is it a civil liberties thing if someone wants to... Someone wants to sit in their house and alter their state of mind to whatever degree, and they're not going to get in their car and, you know... if then why not? Mm. Well, it, it's it's important. Sorry, mate. It's it's important. I think to, to as a start to take people out of that cycle of criminality because yeah. once someone has a criminal record, yeah. it's very difficult to then get a job. Yeah, and then they go, well, okay, well, I can't get a job, a le- legitimate uh, income. Yeah. So what else am I going to do? Yeah. And then, as you've experienced yourself, you, yeah, I, I think when there. when people say that on television, there is a generation of people collectively gnashing their teeth, going, I can get a job, you know. But actually, unless you've been in that situation, you have no idea how, quite how difficult it is. Now, you know, and in my own instance, so I wrote a book, I talked about selling drugs, you know, criminal behaviour, etc., etc. If I ever wanted to take my wife to America, it's unlikely, irrespective of the fact that I'm 13 years clean. The, the, the You know, if I was to apply for a... Normal job, and, and I, again, I use the word normal because I can't think of another word to use. And they would say, well, hang on, you left school in 1984. What were you doing for, till 2006? I was a heroin addict and a, and a low-level drug dealer for bands. You're not getting a job. Mm, yeah, You're not just not going to get the job. Not because necessarily because of what I did, is because someone else would be going for that job who won't have done that. <laughs> and therefore, they are a safer bet. Yeah. Unless, of course, the job involves working in the substance misuse field or being a writer or a musician, in which case we're cool. And You're I'm all of those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, given that your gateway was through cannabis, how do you feel about, and I know we've just spoken about rightly why decriminalisation is would be a good idea. You used the word balls. gateway. I've never used that word. Sorry, yeah, that was me projecting that then. But um, you had the spliff, didn't you? I did. So but I had a drink before I had a spliff and I had a cigarette before I had a drink. Fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm sort of separating alcohol and, and sort of what we'd say class C drugs there, I suppose, aren't I? But, but why? Why would you separate them? I don't know. I don't, I don't know why I've done that. It's just no. not something I've done deliberately. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go at you either. But No, no, but, no, yeah, yeah. But therein, I think, is, again, a, a, you're a well-informed, you know, and you've spoken to me and PJ, but a, a, I don't understand what gateway drug means. I think it's more to do with what we were just saying about the the criminality that is attendant with with dealing with drugs. Whereas well, obviously alcohol is an in- industry, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that, that's sort of what I was getting to. Do you mean because it's an industry, it's, it's legitimised? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so therefore, so yeah, how do you feel about like the, the marketisation and the, the impending legality of cannabis is what I was sort of get, trying to get to? Is it a good thing? I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, if, you, if you're a committed pothead, it might as well be legal anyway. Right? I mean, does anyone really struggle to, to buy weed these days? Uh, really? You know, I, I, I think what's more interesting and, and definitely a good thing is, is the um, people now being able to the idea that the medicinal use of cannabis is actually beneficial to a lot of people. Mm. My mum is has had multiple sclerosis for most of her adult life. Right. They have written her prescriptions for every pharmaceutical drug known to man, almost, you know. And somewhere along the line, someone at Gla- GlaxoSmithKline or the shareholders or whoever, sorry if that's a... <laughs> some, you know, they've made a lot of money. Someone's made a lot of money out of my mum's illness. None of it has worked. So they're just left with, oh, we'll just give them morphine. Now, my sister particularly has lobbied her MP and the local GP and a multiple sclerosis specialist time and time again to say, why can't my mother try medical cannabis to help with the muscle spasms that keep her awake all night, that make her quality of life? Did it? Oh, well, because it's against the law. Yeah, but there's all these tests showing that in some cases not all cases, people have a benefit from it. She's 86. She survived the war. She's had a difficult life. Surely she should be afforded the opportunity mm. to try that. 
The specialist in Bristol sanctioned it, but the GP who has to write the prescription won't write the prescription because he doesn't agree with it. Joker. Can't you just go to another GP? No, because none of them in that area will do it. It's, it's outrageous. And, and I, I've it? heard as well because there was a mother of a child who has lots of seizures. Yeah, yeah uh, it's on the news. Overnight. Overnight. Yeah, the epilepsy. Yeah. And, and, and she, she had to take an offer yeah. at, uh, at airport, customs. Yeah. Yeah. But then they've... they've I've, I work in healthcare, so I've yeah. heard recently that it can yes, it can be prescribed, yeah. but only for pain management. Yeah. So it's it's still not even being fully legalised yeah. yeah. for seizure management. And yet, what is perfectly legal is a boardroom meeting in a big brewery company one day go, right lads, I've got a really good idea, right? I've got this stuff, it's called White Ace, right? We're going to call it cider. It's really strong. It's not cider. It's fucking lethal, and we can produce it really cheap in massive quantities, and we can flood every fucking off license in poor parts of town all over the UK, and we'll make a fortune. Who's in? Yeah, and that's what they do. Why do you, Why do you think other countries? Yeah. Right? That that's they're allowed to do that. Yeah. I mean, who drinks fucking white ace unless you've got? Sorry, if you, if you're a white ace drinker sociably at home. Yeah. Or all those frosty jacks or whatever they are, you know, those overproof white ciders. That <laughs> really mess people up. You work in healthcare, right? Yeah. That's a lot. That, that's allowed. Yeah. That's crackers. But why do you think other countries have the the bollocks? You know, I'm not just talking America. I'm talking local countries like you know in Europe, like Portugal. You mentioned yeah. Switzerland. Have there's there's somebody who has the bollocks to come out and say let's just do it. But yeah, we we can't. We just can't seem to get it over the line, even though. We've had, which I'd not heard before, a successful trial just down the road. Yeah, and and we and the government appointed uh, a professor, some nut, a few years ago, who was their drug czar to look at all the evidence about, and he concluded that actually drew criminal aid, and they sacked him. <laughs> is it like some inherent conservatism, and or is it because, well, I sound like a, a crackpot conspiracist, but the big. Farmer industries and companies like that that you mentioned and, and the big stakeholders in like the economy, the alcohol industry, and they there's a vested interest in keeping the status quo, isn't there? But why? But why? Same sorry, in America as well. But yeah. why? But why though? Why? Why? Why here and why not Portugal? Why have they got it over it's the? It's a line? good question, mate. It is really uh, uh, the answer. It's beyond me. It, it, it's probably t I'm not a, a, you know, a, that knowledgeable about Portuguese politics, but I know that they seem to have just had a, a more humanistic approach to the yeah. whole thing because they accepted they had the humility to go do you know what this hasn't worked the previous way yeah we've got to do something and i don't know where the pressure came from because it's it's a more devoutly religious country yeah than than, than here absolutely, you know? absolutely yeah, big time. and that's often a stumbling block the opioid crisis in america is entirely man-made yeah entirely man-made by by big pharma companies who 10 15 20 years ago basically marketed a tablet for pain relief that they said was non-addictive. It's yeah. an opiate, a non it doesn't exist. You can't have a non addict And they got, and now they're being sued and they're starting to, you know, but completely sanctioned. Why? Money. So that's tramadol, is it? You're talking about? Things like tramadol and, and fentanyl and, and um, little, oh God, there's a whole load of them in America that, that because, that, you know, you pay for your own prescription and um, people were just... It was easier for a GP to go, if you have these, there you go, see you later. You know. Fentanyl is like ridiculously more potent, potent and heroin than heroin. And, yeah, and yeah. lethal. Yeah, yeah, and lethal. So, you know, someone somewhere is cooking all this stuff up and, and selling it. And, 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 and yet they'll put a guy in jail and potentially ruin his life for, for selling a gram of coke to an undercover old bill. The hypocrisy of it all. Yeah. So I guess it has to start with, first and foremost, an acknowledgement that we fucked up, or it's not working. We've tried, and I suppose in this country we're probably just not going to get that, are we? Especially now, no, 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 it's, no, a, no, it's a no, fucking mess. Full circle to yeah. this country now, twenty nineteen, and yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I have friends that are still in active addiction, um, and you know what they tell me to to get access to services now. It's it's harder and harder and harder and harder. Because, like everything yeah. else, the austerity of, you know, uh, of the of the current political setup, <laughs> shall we say? Yeah. You know, when when I see politicians on TV making these big spending promises, it's like 
being offered a plaster by someone who's just half killed you with a standing knife, yeah. isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, thanks. You know, and, and, and again, you know, people who have alcohol addiction problems, uh, there is a far too common, well, it's their own fault. You know, they should sort themselves out. I fought in the war, you know, it's kind of, when you look at the people that have gone, been died from addiction and alcoholism and, 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 and the mental health issues often, mm. for every person that no one's heard of that had no education and no advantage in life, there are also lots of people that are clearly highly intelligent, highly motivated, highly skilled people who also find themselves on the streets. So, you know, it, it clearly doesn't discriminate. It, it, that suggests that willpower and privilege and has nothing to do with anything. It's when something's got you, it's got you. You know, you look at what remains of Paul Gascoigne, you know, uh, mm. yeah. poor fella. You know, I, I believe he's sober, has been for a little while, but there was someone who had everything you could have wanted if, if you wanted, you know, and... Pff, you know, the, the list is endless. Mm. You know, Tony Adams, or whatever. You know, people that have all this stuff, mm. and they still see them getting arrested. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, the well, not surprisingly, the tabloid press. It's almost like they're waiting. They're just waiting for Gaza to fall out of a cab with his bollocks hanging out of a yeah. bottle of gin yeah. in his hand again, all over the front page. Yeah. All the while he remains sober, they're not interested. Don't want to know. They don't want to know. And he's the, and they're the ones who've made it. You look back like Amy Winehouse, yeah, you know, and and sort yeah. of Kurt Cobain and people like that. And people are just hounded. If you know, clearly those people, Amy was not well. Mm. You know, what would people say if if the paparazzi camped outside someone's house with leukemia, mm. waiting for them? To, oh look, they're coming out! They're coming out! You know, now I'm not suggesting that that addiction is a is like leukemia. It's not. It's a different thing. You know, one. You know, for all the obvious reasons, and and I, and I think sometimes people think that those of us in recovery are going. Well, you know, it, yeah, it's a different thing. But but like I said, given that clearly some of the greatest minds known to humankind have succumbed to addiction, and it's it's not just something you do for a laugh, and and then you you know, no one chooses to that. You know, I I, I see so many homeless people. Everywhere I go in the UK, it's yeah. getting worse and worse and worse. It's insane now, isn't it? It's ridiculous, you know. And, and where I live in Hackney, house prices have, have gone up. I think it's like eight hundred percent in the last ten years, right? So all the hallmarks of gentrification in in what was historically a working class area. Yes, you can get smashed avocado on sourdough, whatever the fuck it is, you know, with a skinny chai latte, you know. And yet, outside every cash point, there is a homeless person. Yep. Every Tesco extra. Everyone. You know, just everyone. And whether it's a mental health issue or an addiction or an alcohol, none of them seem to be having much fun. Mm. No one wants to sit there, I don't think. Maybe some do, but not many, you know. And so you see this disparity between, you know, the affluence and the region. And yet, well, hang on a minute, you know, but what's going on here? Mm. And and why is it that so many people who need help are not being given access to that help, or, or it's made so difficult? Austerity, part of it. Yeah, you know we we won't go down the politics wormhole no. because what what interests me again about the book and then you now and sort of like just getting to know you a little bit because yeah. we've had a few conversations and stuff is that you're so passionate and involved and music is still such a big part of your life. Would it have been easy for you to go almost blame music at partly for where you ended up at, at, at your bottom and go, uh, I'm not going to watch bands anymore. Fuck that. I'm not going to, this, this is, this is the old me, <laughs> but you know, you haven't done that at all. Have you? No, not the, the opposite. I, I, I would, would go insane if I, if I couldn't be in a band. If I couldn't be creative, if I didn't have musician friends, it, it it really is for me the greatest medicine I can have. You know that whole process of like we're we're making a new High Town Pirates album yeah. at the moment, and I'll come to that in a minute if I may. Yeah. But but to be, I had some opportunities. You may have come across them in the book. You know, at one point, 
I did have Noel Gallagher sat in my flat going, I fucked him off, he's doing my head in, the singer. Do you want to, do you want to? <laughs> right? Wow. And um, and I was like, that'd be great. And I went in my toilet and I had a hit of heroin and I OD'd and, and when I came round, he'd gone. So that was one opportunity that passed me by. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and probably just as well, because not that I would have been a good replacement for Liam in Oasis. They would have been, Oasis would have been, it'd have been awful, but it would have killed me. Yeah. To have had any level of success, I did a pretty good job of killing myself, nearly killing myself on a gyro, you know what I mean? It's a two bob fucking smack it, you know. So, sorry, I do swear a lot. I apologize. Okay. Um, and then when I cleaned up, one of the things that I soon realized were, was that I really enjoyed just hanging out with musicians again. That, and, and I put this band together and everyone was in recovery. And we're like, look, we're just going to do covers. We're not going to do any of our own stuff. So we can't have musical differences, right, if we're just doing covers. And the only remit is we, we play them as loud as we can and we do them as well as we can. And we use this band as a way of trying to raise money for a char addiction charities or whatever, whatever. And, and we called the band The Should Be Deads. And we did that for nearly seven years. Mm. And it was so much fun. Great name, by the way. Yeah. Great name. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of, did you like build a new, because you were around live music, you were getting the highs of performance and stuff like that, but you were in recovery. That's what I'm sort of getting at. And you were able to well, like, so, balance that. So what, what happened was was that kind of had its sort of natural life. Yeah. Around about the time, just after the book had been published, and and I got a phone call, and I, and I have to be really careful for someone's anonymity here, but mm -hmm. I got asked to try and help a musician who was in a really bad way, whose management had read the book and thought, okay, so Simon Mason, right, he, he, he knows quite a lot about drugs, he's sold drugs, he's been a drug addict, He's been in the music industry. Did did, did. Maybe he might be able to help our friend here. Mm -hmm. And they contacted me, and 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 I got to meet this person. And I've always been far more responsive to people who who kind of operate in the show me don't tell me kind of way, you know. So I don't tell me how to do something. Show me how to do it. And, mm. and, and when it comes to trying to support people whether they're musicians or, or whatever, I, I try and stick to the show me, don't tell me. So this individual had the same stumbling block about recovery that all the other subsequent musicians have had an opportunity to try and help. Generally, they all have this one thing, and it's this fear that if they stop using drugs or alcohol, that they will somehow dry up creatively, that they're all their creativity stems from being awake for three days or whatever it is. And that if they stop doing that, then they their art would suffer. Now, most of them have failed to realise that their art was, <laughs> their art's been suffering for quite a long time. But they won't let go of it because it's a fear. And, of course, the only way you can evidence to someone that, that that's a um, deluded or incorrect fear is... is to get them to a place where they clean up and then try and carry on doing what they're doing. And that involves being around other people that aren't necessarily in recovery and mm. having to be back in that world. So I went on this tour with this particular guy for, for three months, a few years ago. And I realised that by accident or design, I don't know, that I could be around that messy environment because it was my first time. You know, I was mm. I was 10 years clean. Risky. But it was the first time I'd sort of gone back into that world of, of people doing whatever, you know. And it was only after a couple of weeks that I thought, I'm really not asked about what people are doing around me. I really don't want to join in. I'm, I have no desire whatsoever to stay up all night chemically assisted or otherwise I like my best <laughs> um, I've got no desire to, to, to do the mini bar to I just it doesn't affect me and that was quite a powerful realisation because with that 
and and it was it's funny how life is sometimes. When after having that realization, it was shortly after that that I went on a, a, a tour supporting this artist. His, he was always saying to me, "Well, you don't have to go on stage. You're all right." And I said, "Well, put me on stage." And so he did. With the High Town Pirates, <laughs> just on my own. Right. Okay. So you know that the biggest fear I have is just me in a guitar on my own. High Town Pirates is like eleven of us at our full strength horn section. Guitar, you know, you can hide. Yeah. Just, mm. just me, and and, to, and so I had this realization that I can be around that sort of stuff. I can play. I hadn't really played my own songs or written, written my own songs for a long time, and I was like, "I get it. I get this is this is the investment of recovery. That at some point, in my case, it was ten years. Other people, it might be sooner. Other people, it might be later. Some people, it might never happen. That I can be around anything, and I I don't want to join in mm. with with the drinking and the drugging. I mean, that was mind blowing." And not only that, I'd written a book. We turned the book into a play, and I say we because all this happened with the help of a lot of people. The book was my own work. Right? I'm not going to give any credit to anyone else. I sat down, I wrote the fucking thing. I had an editor. Um, but the play was with Phil Fox and Outside Edge, and we were talking about him earlier, and I'd gone off on a tangent and forgot about him, but yeah. Um, and it was like, okay, so all those things that I'd spent a lot of time talking about in the book that I wanted to do since I saw the jam when I was 12 and that addiction robbed me of the opportunity to do well fucking hell I'm, I'm doing it now mm -hmm. it's almost like I'm the Benjamin Button of the rock and roll business I've sort of I'm 51 years old and I feel like a 17 year old kid in his bedroom with his guitar with the enthusiasm railing at the world yeah, yeah. yeah. totally With lots of rail against yeah well yeah and, and that's a remarkable thing. And people talk about, you know, in, in recovery, having a life beyond your wildest dreams. And I never, it makes me a bit cringe sometimes that because everyone's dreams are different. And at the end of the day, I just wanted to stop killing myself and hurting my family. And, I, you know, that was my wildest dream to actually not do that anymore. But with the help of lots of people along the way and the continuing to put lots of other people, I'm getting to have a go at stuff and the learning and all that. Is is the result actually is irrelevant? You know, the the, the it's just being able to create and yeah. be and and be you know have that opportunity. I was about to say you're not bothered about being on the front cover and an enemy, and then I realised hey, how much that ages me to suggest there is an enemy which you could be on the front cover. Of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I would be lying if so. We did an album, first High Town Pirates album. It came about. Out of the blue, I got a phone call, go making a record, here's a few quid. I rounded up some people that I'd known for a long time. I said, look, we've got this opportunity. We've got five days in this studio. Who's in? Show of hands, bang. We went in and we recorded. I think you listened to some yeah, of it on Spotify. Playlist. And I wanted people to hear it. Of course. Yeah. I absolutely wanted people to hear it. I was really proud of it. It was something I wanted to do all my life. Um... I felt that there was a, an ongoing recovery theme to it. Not everyone in the band at that time was in recovery or abstinence recovery. Um, I felt ridiculously proud of it, you know, and um, and I kind of had this idea, given that I'd learned a little bit along the way about self-care, self-preservation, mental self-preservation, physical self-preservation, that, that, okay, I'm, I can go with this idea of this record being heard. I can really lean into it and mm. believe in it. And if it doesn't, I'll still be okay. Which is a, a, a an important learning, I think, for, for, for anyone, not just people in recovery, but is that, you know what, it's the hope that kills you. Right? <laughs> it's open to evidence for the year, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't going to say it. Either, but, <laughs> but you still go with that hope, otherwise why go at all? Yeah. Right? You, yeah. You'd still go, because that's your investment, isn't it? That's what makes it when it happens, if it happens, you know, and it's the same, I think, with, with, with the music, it's the same, the whole High Town Pirates thing, hopefully is going to become a platform for artists and writers and musicians to have that opportunity to believe. And you know what, if you have that opportunity and you believe in, and, and it's meant to be, and, and you're, 
piece of art or your piece of writing or your piece of music kind of blows up, that's fantastic. And if it doesn't, we're here to catch you on the way down. You know, that, that would be the dream. That would be the life beyond the wildest dream, to, to be able yeah. to establish something like that. It's, it's interesting how, uh, obviously, you, you, you're really enjoying having that creative outlet now. But you mentioned just before uh, about if you would have made it as a success, you know, back a, a genuine back then, yeah. when you're in that, that rut of addiction and, mm. and, and everything, and um, that you would have got worse. It would have made you I'd worse and possibly killed you. I'd have died. Whereas a lot of people who are in some kind of a rut, whether it's addiction or depression or something yeah. like that, a lot of people talk about the next thing. Well, if it just had, mm. if it just had, if it just had. Yeah. But it's like, you know, you have this realisation now. Well, it doesn't matter what, what I was given. It doesn't yeah. matter what opportunity I had. I would have fucked it up or I would have, yeah. I would have killed myself. Well, I had some pretty good opportunities, didn't I? You know, more yeah. than most, you know. And and I would have, because it, it wouldn't have made me not an addict. It would have just made me an addict with, with, a, with, a, with more money at my disposal. You know, if there'd been any sort of commercial success. And, and, you know, um, it, musical history, but but history in itself is is littered with the corpses of people who thought that they could buy their way out of that particular situation. You know, with with money, and and I don't know if you can. You know, as as if you are an alcoholic, an addict, it seems to me that that it's actually harder if you have the trappings of wealth, in some respects, because you, perhaps you don't reach that that kind of rock bottom and again that's another expression that people can interpret however they want I don't think a rock bottom person has got anything to do with external circumstances I think it's an internal mm. it's a place of such deep despair mm. you know Robin Williams bless him you know killed himself with uh, one of the most you know an amazingly successful life and yet his depression got the better of him you know I, I was talking about a, a friend of mine who was you know 30 years I think nearly clean you know I knew through recovery who ended her own life a few years ago because of her mental health. And, and this woman came from privilege, absolute privilege, you know, and, and she was never going to worry about buying and washing up liquids, you know, whether to use sort of posh stuff or, <laughs> you know, that's never, never had been, never would mm. be an issue for that person. So that sort of tells me that none of that stuff really makes much difference. And in fact, it makes it harder to ask for help because you kind of somehow feel guilty about saying, do you know what? I'm fucked here. Mm. And again, I think with, with, with footballers, with musicians, and, and I'm really pleased to see that people are talking about mental health issues mm. with, with young men in particular, yeah. given the, the suicide rate, is that they've kind of lost that, I'm not allowed to complain because I'm successful. I'm doing the thing that every lad around here wants to do maybe not every lad, but, you know, yeah. for a living. I'm getting paid to play football, but I don't feel happy, but I'm not allowed to say anything because I'm getting paid to play football or I'm a rock star with a stupid guitar sex swimming pool. Shut up, you know. Yeah, it's great that there's a platform now for men to be vulnerable. In yeah. The open. Have you heard that uh, on stage interview that Vinnie Jones did this week, by the way? No. I saw it. He's talking about his wife. Tell you what. What's... And, th and, this is, and this isn't... Your average footballer, either this yeah. is the extremes in terms of the hard man. football yeah, hard man. What, what, what happened? His wife, well, his wife, his wife died of cancer, and he he, he oh, did. I, I think it was a podcast, was it? It was like a live podcast on stage. Right. Okay. Yeah, it was an interview with the Daily Mirror, I think. But they, they did like yeah. a podcast on stage. I yeah. saw it yesterday, and, and, and yeah, he I, broke down in tears. Uh, you know, just describing it, sort of when she was approaching the end, and and how he dealt with it, and he just wouldn't have had that. Yeah. Five, ten years ago, would you? Yeah. And, and previously, and it's not someone like him. Exactly. The Kismo was such a yeah. part of who Absolutely. Yeah, Dennis Wise is nuts, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It yeah. 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 was Dennis stock Wise, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Was he in Lock, Stock and Two yeah. Smoking Barrels playing the, yeah. the yeah, archetypal yeah. hard man? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and, and you know what? In, in perhaps even in, in, you know, without making ourselves sound too self important, but you know, you're sitting and talking to people, you talk to me, and, and, and we're doing that very same thing. And it's not half 11 in the pub, everyone's had 10 lagers. I fucking love you, mate. It's not that, is it? Or in the kitchen sniffing Charlie being yeah. all serious. It's, yeah, it's not that. It, it's, it's, there's water and coffee on the table and, and my vape over there. <laughs> <laughs> Surely this has to be a good thing. Yeah, definitely. You know, 100%. You know, and, and to... I've learned from other people 
that it's okay to talk about this stuff. You know, uh, don't get me wrong. If I was on on the bus going through Bootle, you know, I perhaps would go. Can I tell you about the time I was abused by a priest? <laughs> you know, you have to pick your moments. Yeah, yeah, of course. Or your environments. And I think a lot of that conversation and the ability to do that has come from writing, has come from performing a show, has come from from the band, has come from be, being able to take those risks. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been as important to my recovery as anything else I've done. You know, the, the just feeling safe to go, you know, I'm going to write something here and I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to put it out there in the world and... The, a, most people are never going to hear it. And B, some people might not like it. And C, fuck it, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. It yeah. works as well, doesn't it? Like we, 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 so. We've seen tangible results. PJ, after he did the podcast there. Yes. And we're not taking any credit for that because that was him. He was unbelievably honest. Yeah. yeah. But he had people approach him, didn't he? On, yeah. on Twitter and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. You've just gotta, we've just got to keep talking about it. Yeah. And, and put it out there. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, you know, this is the opposite to the kind of fellow at the end. When I used to go in pubs a lot, I had this kind of inbuilt lunatic detector. I couldn't detect my own lunacy, but, <laughs> but I was always wary of, there'd always be like the fellow at the end of the bar standing up with his 20 Bensons on the bar and his fag just sort of like drinking methodically like that. I'd never go near that guy. Yeah. Don't fucking go anywhere. He, he don't go near him, you know. And yet, we were all that guy. You know, I say we, I, I speak for my... I was that guy, just but my defence mechanism was different. It was like a... I'd learned some kind of language. Yeah, I'm all right, mate, I'm sweet. You know, I'm, I'm okay, so cush, do whatever cut me nonsense it was. Um, I'm fine, I'm all right, you know. What's the difference? You know, it's just a different way of keeping people aware. It's a mask that you're saying. It's a mask, it's yeah. a facade. I wasn't all right. But I didn't know how to tell people that, you know, and, and I think with a lot of people who've been through any kind of trauma, the fear of, of opening up that wound or, or becoming vulnerable, particularly if you've been involved in addiction and street addiction and criminality and jails and institutions, it's really hard to drop that mask because it served you. It kept you alive. It's it kept you alive, it. yeah. It, it, it served you and... and you know, I watched all of that podcast with PJ because I bet, you know, when he was bevying up, he was a handful, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and and he's never, he doesn't even, he would never say that he was in that respect. He, he's not, he's a really humble guy. I, yeah. I have a Great. lot of admiration for him. Great live as well, by the way. I was, yeah. I saw him the other week. Yeah, lovely. But we, we, we mentioned this briefly before. And, and Billy, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, I was in rehab that. with Billy Moore 20 years ago. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. He was definitely a handful. He was, he definitely, was definitely a handful. Yeah. And and neither you know I didn't stay clean at that time. He did, and then uh, well, you know what happened. But, you know, but we we there was an old this rehab we were in. There was an old gym, and I somehow managed to get my hands on a guitar, and I'd, I'd sit in, and the acoustics in the gym were really great. So I'd be sitting there trying to learn chords on the guitar, and he'd be on the punch bag in the corner. You're right, Billy. Yes, mate. I'd say uh, <laughs> one day, mate. Yes, or right, well, you know, and and then life just went. You know, his life went. Thailand and everything that happened there and, and I you know and um, I'm so pleased for him mm. yeah he's doing great work as well he's doing great work with his because brother because he inspires people yeah absolutely you know if you can come back from that you know I shit myself after three nights in, in, in a police station let alone two years in, a, in the Thai prison and you come back from that and, and, and document it and write it and uh, he'd be the first to say he didn't have an education. It just goes to show, you know, the remarkable sort of fortitude of yeah. people, you know, and it's a common expression in recovery. If you put a, a tenth of the effort into your recovery that you used to put into getting your drugs, man, you'll fly. <laughs> yeah. do, do you know, just to, obviously, I, for me, Britpop was like, that was probably my year of a teenager, like Oasis. You look too young. Cast, yeah, I wish. So it's a, it's a evocative era for me growing yeah. up in secondary school and all that. But probably for quite a few people watching or listening, they'd, they'd be like, uh, wouldn't mean that much to them. But you literally lived in, in the heart of that, in London, mixing with Blair and Oasis. And like, tell us, the, describe that era a little bit, if you can. It's funny, I'm, I've, I've just, a friend of mine's just sent me a book that he's, he's about to publish to sort of, I don't mean, what is it, to proofread it or something. Um, 
and it and it perfectly it's it's set in that era and um my daughter's 11 and she's just starting to get into music and she said to me today this morning before she went to school she went Daddy, have you heard of a band called Caveman? I'm like, no, she went good. <laughs> I really, I really, she's like, she's found something of her own, right? On, on her Spotify playlist. And the reason I say that is I think what that was like, I don't know what it was like for everyone else, what that felt like to me at that time, going to get the NME from Camden Tube Station the day before the rest of the country got it. Right? You, could, you could get it from the newsstand. In, the, in Camden Tube on a Wednesday afternoon, I think. Like hot off the press. Literally hot off the press. And opening it up and seeing who was playing. Oh, I know him or I know where that place is. It felt like we were part of something. It felt like this was a, everyone was kind of, everyone seemed to know everybody, however localised that might sound in Camden at the time. It wasn't just Camden. I mean, the Verve weren't from fucking London. Were from Wigan, like, like yeah. Exactly, you know. They ended up down there. Rightly or wrongly, I think for for a couple of years, um, it felt like a good time to, to be alive if you liked that kind of music. You know? But um, I still maintain to my dying day that the high watermark of all that wasn't Nebworth at all. It was, it was Pulp at Glastonbury in 1995. I was there. Um, the Roses were supposed to headline. John Squire fell off his BMX and cracked his shoulder. They pulled out of it, so they put Pulp in. So. Um, and you can't actually see the whole gig on YouTube. They, I don't know, this must be some legality something, but they finished with Common People, right? And before they go into this song, and I was at the side of the stage, I say that just because I was at the side of the stage. <laughs> Anyway, um, and before they do Common People, Jarvis Cocker says, he talks about, you know, if a skinny get from Sheffield, it's taken him 17 years to get here, to be at Glastonbury, you know, after years of being ignored. This is 25 years ago mm -hmm. now, right? And I remember sort of, not thinking about it at the time, but many, 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 many years later, after I cleaned up, Every time I think about what he said then, because he said something, I think, which absolutely nailed it. He said, you know, you can't buy feelings. You can't actually buy anything that's worth having. And then he launched into common people, right? Wow. And that's so fucking true powerful. for me. So powerful to, to, to have that moment in front of however many people are watching it and to come out with that. Yeah. Wasted on most people because everyone was off their tits on pills, right? But... <laughs> But, so it's a <laughs> but it stuck with me. It stuck with me. And if nothing else happened in Britpop, it, there was that one moment, and for everyone there had their own experiences of it, because you know what? There were a lot of bands that were great and there were loads that were rubbish. And, and it just says a lot about how um, my addiction, how I didn't get signed, you know, because anyone could get signed. It seemed like you just walk into a, a bar with a good haircut <laughs> in 1994, you got a record deal. You know? <laughs> And I still managed to not get a record deal. And I had a really good haircut. It's the same one I've got now, probably. <laughs> um, it was a remarkable time, but but I'm pretty sure if you'd spoke to people who were at the centre of the whole punk rock thing, who, who, who saw the pistols at the Manchester Free Trade Hall, yeah. they'd say, but we felt that too. Yeah. Yeah, or yeah. dance music and then uh, or that's the end of the days. People yeah. at Quadrant yeah. Park in 1991. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they were going to change the world, right? Or, yeah. So uh, horses for courses, but you know, I my favorite one of my favorite bands, Supergrass. You know, have just reformed and they're going to go mm. and play again. I think that's brilliant. Mm. I think that's great. I'm not. Um, yeah, nostalgia is a comedy in itself. Now, uh, comedy. Uh, uh, it's an economy. economy in itself. Yeah, you know. Yeah, nineties, especially nineties yeah. economy. Yeah, yeah. There's the, the, the space, space. Of, the shine on weekend in. in yeah. You yeah. know, they. they managed to convince a couple of hundred people to go to Minehead, which is not far from where <laughs> I was born, for a weekend and watch bands, yeah. And all those bands are getting paid, so yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great, right? The musicians are getting paid to play songs. Nothing wrong with that. Would, how many of the... I'm not asking you to indiscreetly name bands and stuff like that, but how many of them would now... Like no, yeah. How many would would would, would want to chase you <laughs> out the building for <laughs> <laughs> various misdemeanors? Do you know what? I, I, I've always tried to. I spoke in the book specifically about you know 
being around Oasis because you couldn't not write about that because I was there and I saw something that we may never see again yeah. from spitting distance, you know, up close and personal. I, I think 25 years down the line, I was a tiny grain of sand in a, in a, in a sort of Britpop beach, you know, it, it wasn't just me doing what I was doing. It was, a few, you know, of course. Yeah. Um, and, um, that would have been a full-time job. Yeah. And one day when my daughter's a bit older and, and ask me what I did in the nineties, I'll say, you know what, I did some stuff that was stupid. I did some stuff. I saw some stuff that was great mm. and I survived. Um, and a lot of people didn't. Yeah, you know, and, and a lot of people are still. I spoke to this fellow the other week, right? And it's one of the saddest things. I've known him for years, and he comes to some of the NA meetings that I go to from time to time. He never stays very long, he comes and gets a cup of tea. And I've never spoke to him before until a couple of months ago, I think. And I got his name, and I was talking to him. He was outside having a ciggy, and he said, "He said, you know what? I remember going to Spike Island." to see the roses at Spike Island. He goes, I don't know what fucking happened after that. He goes, I've been on methadone for two, you know, it's just the way he said it. And he said, I am, I'm not gonna survive. I've lost the will to keep trying. And I'm like, shit, he's my age. He's not an old man, he's 50. <laughs> Something happened, I think, the the downside of, of Britpop, if, is what we want to call it, is that, Thankfully, the majority of people kind of just dusted themselves down and went on and, and got married and had kids. And But because it encapsulated so many people, that percentage of people, whatever it would be, 5%, I don't know, 2%, 1% of people who fell into addiction yeah. is a lot of people. Mm, yeah. It transacts to a lot of people. It's not like a couple of hundred people. It's tens of thousands of people more. And... Um, you know the the kind of flow chart of of music culture and, and drugs is that what goes up must come down right so you know in in the mid 60s when mods were taking loads of purple hearts and whatever they got and then you have this kind of psychedelic era and everyone starts taking downers and then you have the 70s and prog rock and i'm sure those things are related <laughs> <laughs> and then punk and then everyone's taking speed and everyone goes up and then there's another wave of heroin addiction here in liverpool as bad as anywhere, worse. Yeah. And everyone's down again and then the whole house thing comes up and everyone goes up again and takes uppers and then there's another massive wave of heroin yeah. addiction and everyone, you know, it's kind of does that. And the numbers get bigger every time. And I think the fallout of, of the thing that we call Britpop, sadly, was that um, a lot of people got in way beyond their depth because it became... Normal, you know, was it Noel famously said, you know, like taking drugs, like having a cup of tea. And no one batted an eyelid because mm. we used to go to the pub on a Tuesday afternoon and have a couple of pills. <laughs> so one day like Sir Noel and Damon Alborn and Liam didn't become addicts? Because they're not addicts. So they were just able to ultimately, they, they just, didn't have the illness? Your word... I'd agree with it personally. Illness, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I remember I read, read Keith Richards' autobiography a few years ago when it came out, right? Who was, yeah. you know, kind of held up for better or worse as, you know, the ultimate sort of yeah. rock and roll, elegantly wasted junkie musician type. Yeah. And probably the reason why I thought Heron was a good idea. <laughs> Him and Peter Perrett from the only ones. Um, like, if they can do that and be on Heron, then what's the problem, right? Anyway. Um, but I read through his book and he doesn't use any kind of self-deprecating language or he doesn't seem to suffer from any lack of self-esteem or or doubt or critical over self-analysis analysis or oversensitivity or all this stuff that seems so inherent in people with addiction and alcohol problems. They seem to have either all of that or lots of it. Yeah. He doesn't know any of that. He was like, yeah, well, you know, it was an experiment that went on for too long, but they fucking, man, da, 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 you know, and he just kind of moved on. Yeah. And I imagine that, that he's made wide up the same way as, as Noel or Damon or most people, in fact, that you get to a point where you go, do you know what? It's fucking over. I need to just, you know, and... and like they had a choice in the matter. They yeah. chose. Yeah. 
Yeah, like those but, people. Whereas people like yourself, you feel like almost it chose you because you were trying to. Well, I, st- I meet people whole- from time to time who can have one cigarette a day. One cigarette a day. What the fuck's that? How can you have <laughs> one <laughs> cigarette? <laughs> Yeah, no, I've met a few people recently and I, and I completely believe them when they tell me. It's like, if I, I've been on this stupid vape thing, right, for years, right? I went to Madrid to watch the Champions League final and, and I'd gone on holiday with my missus before, so we went to Marrakesh the week before and my daughter's been nagging me to drop the vape and she's like, you know. So I'd kind of negotiated this detox of the strength of the, the e-liquid, so I was on like nothing, like zero nicotine yeah. practically. And we and we went to, we, went, we got friends that live in Morocco, so we went to Marrakesh for a week. And I'd seen a flight from Marrakesh to Madrid on the two days before the final for 35 quid, so I'm like, sweet. I haven't got a ticket, but okay, I'm gonna go. Yeah. And um, and I left my vape at home, I'm like deliberately, right, that's it, I'm gonna not vape in Morocco and da da da. And it wasn't that bad, you know. I was a bit kind of like antsy for a couple of days, you know. I've been smoking, I've had nicotine in my system for like ever. Um, holiday was boss, nothing bad happened. I didn't lose my temper. It was, you know, it was yeah. kind of walk in the park actually. Went to Madrid, football was great. Two minutes after, three minutes after the final whistle, my missus rings me. I'm thinking to say, hey, well, nice one. Da, da, da. And we'd been burgled back home. She'd just got back to London. And she walked into our flat and we've been burgled. And uh, which means we have to win the Champions League again next season, Jurgen, because it killed it for me. All right, lads, if you're watching, <laughs> it completely killed it. My missus walked into our flat in London. We've just won the Champions League, but we've been burgled. And they've gone in my daughter's room and they've stolen her piggy bank. I can eleven year old kids. Yeah, you know, chunky scum. <laughs> I don't know who it was anyway. But my head's just goes at that yeah. point it's, and my missus is at home I can't get a flight back and I don't know what they've taken and she's really upset and they've torn all the stuff out of the you bedroom be and, them, and the I don't want to get home them. there's no way you're getting home there's no flights right none Not you know. so I turned to this fella and he's having a ciggy and I'm like mate can I have a cig and he went yeah fuck it eight, six times and I'm like yeah whatever I did 60 mobile reds in two days wow just one I didn't enjoy a single one of them I was like, what am I doing? What am I doing? You know, it just, and it just, am I recovered? I'm not recovered. I see what you mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of like, those people that can have one cigarette can probably have one gram of Coke and three pints every month with the lads or the lasses, whatever, on a work, or whatever you want to do it. Most people are like that, thankfully. You know. But the people that I feel the most affinity to my tribe, if you want, are the people that can't do that for whatever reason. And I don't care what the reason is. I try to figure out, you know, why addiction, why me, why me, why not, Liam? You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it just is. And and I think that, that that was when recovery really started to actually make sense to me. It was when I tried to stop making sense of it and just accepted it. Oh, it's because this happened and you lost your dad and you got nonced. And uh, I don't actually think any of that made me an addict. I really don't. It didn't help. It was a lot of stuff that I had to wade through and try and unpick and find resolution to in recovery. But I generally don't think, it, I think it would have been no different had those things not happened. I just think some people yeah. are just somehow wired up a bit differently. Mm. And, and they don't have an off button. And, um, but, and I say that because I've met so many people who had fucking great childhoods and still ended up blowing mm-hmm. off some fella for a five pound stone on the dock road, you know. I, and they, nothing bad happened to them. Yeah. So you, you, you still now couldn't put your finger on, maybe was it, was it a, was there a hole that you were trying to fill or anything? You, you still don't know what it was. I, I, I don't know if I care anymore, really. Generally, it's just kind of just is. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's that people use that expression, a hole to fill. And I remember this counsellor saying to me in one of the many detoxes or rehabs I was in years ago, it's not about filling the hole, it's about emptying it. 
I was like, well, it's a bit cosmic, isn't it, man? Mm. Three days clean, I was ratting my bollocks off. I, like, I don't want to hear that. But now I understand it. I, that kind of, I, I get that. It's not about filling the hole, it's about emptying it in whatever way. And um, for me, and I suspect it's the same for PJ and Billy and, and countless other people, it's kind of like once you've got a handle on this, this, this way to live, this sobriety that we have, Trying to help other people is vital to maintaining that. In for me, I don't know about other people, but like I said, I think those other two gentlemen would agree if they were here, in whatever way that might be, you know. Um, because it actually means that if I'm not thinking about myself all the time, I'm actually much happier, and I think most people are actually much happier yeah. when we're not caught up in that. It doesn't surprise me that a lot of my female friends, acquaintances that I see in recovery or in the wider world on social media, a lot of them talk about mental health issues and yet every five seconds they're taking photographs of themselves and posting it all over, you know, it's kind of... That's just not just the mentally ill though, Simon, that's everyone now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not... With the it, obsession with the self and the, like, the, the, and the Yeah, away. yeah, and listen... Do you, mean, do you mean because the chasing the, 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 chasing the dopamine hit of putting the thing out there, getting the likes and all that, and then it's, yeah. it's still it's still a cycle that they're in? Yeah. It's just a different... Yeah, there's a, different it's a kind of narcissism to that, and I'm guilty of it, you know. Um, I've tried to get a handle on it, you know. I, I'm, I'm a, in a band, I'm, I'm an author, I write. I need to have a social media presence. Yeah. Do you, mean, do you mean your Instagram's all pictures of your ass and selfies? No, it's not actually. <laughs> um, it's it, uh, there's loads of my wedding up there, which has pleased my wife. It's like finally, um, but it's another addiction. <clears throat> yeah, I can see that. I can see the the, the similarities because you're ch the chasing something, and then it's checking, yeah. checking, checking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who's read my story? Yeah, and all how many that. likes have I got? And, and I've been had yeah. to be really quite draconian with with just with Tabitha and my daughter. This. Yeah. It's like, do you know what? Just leave it if you can. You know, really. Difficult though, isn't it? From 11 going on 12 and the mates will all be on Instagram. Because you don't want it to be the odd one out, exactly. Yeah, yeah, which yeah but, but but where's the... In, it's the same people that decided to to make White Ace or Frosty Jack that probably went, oh, we're going to do an app where, where people can change their body size now or whatever it is. They've just... Shit, just... yeah. Did you hear about the fellow who actually was involved in the planning of the like button in Facebook? And he's since left the company and spoken about how he feels morally responsible for creating a, a huge problem in society. And there was a degree of not, obviously they couldn't you know, predict all the downsides yeah, of from course. social media, but they were aware, yeah. loosely aware that this could create yeah. issues. There yeah. was a part of the site that they were deliberately tapping into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, yeah. And it, it clearly is a, yeah. you know, a, another form of, of, of addiction that people, and I said, like I said, I'm, I'm guilty of it, you know, and, and in an ideal world, I'd be able to employ someone <laughs> to just do all that. And, and you know, but I, I can't, you know, and, and I would know for a fact I would be much happier without a smartphone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I kind of think I'd like to get to that point, actually, where so, I just think, you know what, I've just got a, an old style brick phone and you can ring me. And I can ring you, and I can text Tabitha. Have you finished? Have you got to school? You're on the bus, and the rest of it's just fucking nonsense. See, I don't think it's the smart. I think people demonise people. First of all, people demonise Facebook. They demonise smartphones, but that's not the issue for me. The issue is, is human behaviour. You know, yeah. you've just you've just correlated behaviour on social media and addiction to likes and validation and whatever else yeah. comes along with it. Yeah. You've just correlated that with with addiction to substances or you know whatever else. And, and I think that says it all because uh, I'm a firm believer that social media doesn't do these things. It just exposes human behavior that was already there. It facilitates it though yeah, as well. Yeah, it does facilitate it. And there's, there's, there, there, are, there are examples of it going the other way in terms of like, you know, you, people do behave differently now because of Instagram. Like people didn't used to do that all the time. Yeah. People didn't used to do certain pouty faces. Yeah. Um, but I think in terms of the, the general stuff, the validation and all that and, and things going viral and whatever else all these things they're, they're often referred to as sort of new terms and yeah. and uh, you know the, the platforms of technology that we use now is often demonized because of these things and because of the 
anxiety and everything else that, that, that we, we've seen increase, uh, you know, since the, the invention mm. of these things. But I think it just, it just exposes people. Yeah, for sure. It's it's like it's it's a, a narcissistic sort of mirror of human behaviour because, I, yeah. I, you know, we're all old enough to remember getting holiday photos back two weeks after you come back from your holiday and the anticipation. <laughs> Where's me? Where's, where, you know, so Fucking red eye. Yeah, exactly. I can't put a filter on that. Right. Yeah, but but the the anticipation, the excitement was the same. It just took two weeks. Right now, it's just like boom, instant, you know. And, and I'm gonna airbrush myself. You know, I mean, yeah. Instagram is just makeup for fellas, isn't it? Really, yeah. <laughs> you know. It's like, I'm gonna put this filter. Oh, look, I look three years younger. <laughs> I like everyone's got their favourite filter, you know. And and we, I, I just think the whole. I mean, a, 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 using a drugs addictively is about instant gratification, right? And 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 you can change how you feel. And it, this is a regular thing that used to happen to me. So I'd be at, at the end of the addiction, you know, trying to just get 10 quid together by robbing a bit of bacon out of the shop or whatever, you know, pathetic, low-level, junky behaviour. And all the while I was trying to get that tenner together, I'm, oh, I'm dying and my head's doing a number on me. I'm the worst human being in the world and I might as well fucking die and blah, blah, blah. And then I've got the tenner and I've made the phone call and the fella's two minutes away because he's always two minutes away. He's just around the corner. And all of a sudden, I'm not dying anymore. It, it's, it's a remarkable thing. You know, I haven't used any drugs yet, but I've called it on and I know they're coming. And I, I'm like Lazarus. It, 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 I mean, that the, the, the human mind is a remarkable thing, mm. you know. And I've scored, and and it's and I've got it, and and I can, whereas t ten minutes ago I'm like, oh, I can't you doing the junky shuffle up the road like that. Now I'm fucking bombing down the road. No, I haven't used any drugs yet, but some of the chemistry has changed mm. in my head, right? That's kind of the instant gratification that I think a lot of people, myself included, sometimes are looking at with that. Like you say, you're mirroring human behaviour, and I worry that. We've we've kind of slept walk into this thing yeah. that you know unless I've got a thousand likes on a a song that I've posted, yeah, it's like oh somehow denigrates the yeah because everything's instant. We have no emotional attachment to it. I'm really okay with being fifty one, right? Because being fifty one, I saw the Jam, I saw the Roses, I saw the Smiths. I used to save my pocket money to go and buy their records read about it in the NME and have to wait two weeks, three weeks. And I personally think that's a much better relationship with the arts and each other and all that kind of stuff than going, have you heard this band there on Spotify? There you go, have it for nothing instantly. Yeah. It means nothing. Mm. There's no investment in it. Yeah, even when like a new album drops now and I'm, like, I remember going to HMV and like being so excited with me at nine ninety nine to buy yeah. the Super Fairies new album yeah. or something like that. I'm now still love music, still excited when I, I Bonnie Vare new album, but yeah. I, it's not that same type of excitement because as soon as I just go on my iPhone, it's yeah. there, bang. And yeah, pay my monthly subscription, but I can just. And if you look at, at the the plays that an album gets, I know we got back onto music again, but must be oh, I was, must be making another album. <laughs> And I don't care who it is, the Arctic Monkeys, right? And and they they they're at their latest album, and you look at the first track, it's had ten times the amount of plays as the tenth track. Do it when you get home. Just look at any big album. People don't get past the first attention three songs. Span. Attention yeah. span. And the attention span is gone. Yeah. Whereas and attention spans are fucked. Right. So because we want everything instantly, and then we want to change yeah, yeah, yeah. it instantly, yeah. and that's what yeah. I mean. That's 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 where I see the real damage doing. The impact is that when we buy vinyl, or bought vinyl. Go home and you you know whatever, whatever you're doing. You put side one on and you get the the sleeve, and you put the music on and you go for this. Oh, the, the lyrics and everything. And, and oh blimey, I better turn it over. And you listen to the whole thing. Now and, even yeah. the biggest bands on the planet can't get everyone to listen to all nine, ten tracks on. That their could own. even be diehard fans, couldn't it? I know just this DJ and I I've, I I DJed in the in in Liverpool and around for over ten years. And even DJing in, in that 10 year period changed because people used to, I, I play a lot of house music, but you play 
you know, your average house tune, the full version, not, yeah. not the radio weather, there'd be six, yeah. seven minutes long, some of them. Yeah. And then you play the next one, play the next one, play the next one. And then with the invention of the digitization, if you like, yeah. uh, you know, Serato came out and tracked her, yeah. the digital DJ programs, mm-hmm. you mix, you, the, the length of time that you played one tune got shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah. Uh, and then you got you got DJs um, who literally play, will play 30 seconds of a tune. Yeah. Because, and, and I'd see it DJing. Um, and I used to play, I used to love gigs where I played multiple genres. Yeah. I go from like R&B and hip hop into like funk, disco and whatever else. And you try and drop I Feel Love by Donna Summer now, like all like eight, nine minutes of it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not happening. People, people would be, the dance floor would empty. Yeah. Like you you had to, it got to a point, I don't know, maybe 18 months, two years ago, you've got to change your song at least every 90 seconds. So I think, and Someone told me this, and I kind of believe them with the digitization and the streaming of music. That you know, whatever, whether you're a 17 year old kid in your first band trying to get on Spotify or whatever it is, or some deluded middle aged twat like me, <laughs> no need for that. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> the, the, getting on playlists now is where it's at, right? For new artists on on Spotify, in particular, and that they their algorithms are looking for a chorus within 15 seconds or 20 seconds if it's kind of that kind of guitar or pop music that they can somehow figure out they've gone to a minor to a major it must be the chorus right they'll pick it up right now that's kind of, so people are now pandering to all oh, right shit we better write songs that where we get to the chorus within 20 seconds otherwise we're not going to get anyone listening to it and you sort of think is that that's what we've come to you know and the the maybe the kickback against all that will, will be like historically like there's always a kickback to something right so we had prog rock you know songs that, that went yeah. on for like 15 minutes and Zeppelin. people went do you know what I'm fucking had enough of this one two three four for a moment you know so maybe maybe people will I'm trying to finish on a note of optimism it go we're kind of sick of Simon Cowell and we're kind of sick of Spotify and we're kind of sick of algorithms I'm going to make exactly the music that I want to make, whether I'm a, a dance music DJ that wants to do a homage to I Feel Love and do a 25-minute Little Louis French kiss, well, giving yeah. my age away because <laughs> I don't know any current EDM, but, you know, whatever. I'm going to do that, and I don't care what Spotify thinks, and I don't care what anyone else thinks. I'm going to do it because I want to do it. Yeah. And I'm going to just not give all that power away to to other people that are telling me how I should make my art to satisfy the instant gratification of whatever you know mm. maybe there will be a kickback to it and maybe hopefully prog rock won't come back but you know <laughs> <laughs> something definitely better bohemian rhapsody being the exception obviously everyone loves to play a lot, i hate queen hate queen what's that just hate them brian may's hair <laughs> oh, that's got a lot to answer. For. I can't get beyond his hair. That's a bad idea. I mean, Listen, they're just they're, one they're of those. are back in, mate, in this city no. right now. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. everyone's got one artist, right, or whatever it is, or a player, a footy player. Go, he's bossing. No, I mean, shit, mate. You know? yeah. and, and, and Queen are just my sort of. I just can't. Nah, can't can't be a bit of Queen in, in the on like a long. Taxi journey or no. car journey or something no, like that. No, no, no. He, he often riffs on this. He's queen obsession. We're going to explore this next time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming in, no, mate. My pleasure. Uh, superb. Thank you. Nice one. Oh, thank you. Thanks it. for having me. And there is going to be a new High Town Pirates album out soon, hopefully. Soon. And, yeah. and just everyone involved in this record is sober, clean, recovering addict from the people doing the artwork, all the musicians involved. So, yeah, help Excellent. us out. Maybe watch out for it and give us a listen. Excellent. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome.